just what is it like to be a Ukrainian soldier defending Bakhmut? And how is Russian strategy changing as winter falls? And how are the Ukrainians working to counter it? All this can be covered in this video, and we are going to be breaking it all down for you. This comes to us from Radio Free Liberty Radio Europe. As always, links in the description. They really have been doing a great job lately of getting interviews uh, with the troops on the front lines. It is wild to see just the number of uh, deserted buildings, right? You see these streets are basically empty. You can also see there's these tank barriers that if for some reason the Ukrainian forces that currently hold the town think that they're going to have to withdraw, they will put them up to either create uh, checkpoints that will slow or even potentially stop Russian forces. And almost certainly these intersections are also marked clearly on maps uh, so as what are called TRPs or target reference points. And what TRPs will let you do is quickly call basically pre-programmed fire missions onto those locations. So if they did have to withdraw from Bakhmut, they would have all of these intersections, these TRPs set so that if a drone simply sees a column of tanks stop here they just tell the artillery hey fire on trp tango 2 and the artillery has the coordinates already plugged and just starts dropping rounds right on those tanks as they're trapped in front of this barrier <laughs> Оця установка стугне, чим дуже ефективна, тому що тут дуже велика живучість особового складу і розрахунку, який керує цією установкою. So, this is an interesting fact about the Stugna missile system is that it was actually developed in Ukraine. This is uh, Ukraine has a long history of being an a uh, dis arms design and manufacturing hub. And so that industry has stayed in Ukraine. And it's a tremendous advantage, both because Ukraine is an economically developing country, uh, can't always buy Western built weapon systems. Their Western built weapon systems are very expensive. Obviously, they're manufactured in Western countries where wages and materials are more expensive. To solve this problem, the Ukrainians d have repurposed, re-engineered, and created from whole cloth their own weapon systems, of which the Stugna P is one good example. This takes proven technology, which is a, a guided missile, I think it's a wire or IR guided missile, and combines it with some of the remote standoff technology. So you can see here, it's a simple uh, uh, LCD screen uh, in a ruggedized box with very simple controls that let the user set up the missile system, but then deploy it, uh, engage targets with it from a standoff distance. It's simple, inexpensive to manufacture, and most importantly, tailor-made for the Ukrainian environment, right? Tailor-made against Russia, because while Russia has a variety of security threats it has to encounter with its military, Ukraine has only one security threat, and that has been Russia since almost 2008, uh, at least. And so they've had decades to build weapon systems designed just to counter Russian style tactics. And this sort of standoff distance, anti armor, anti personnel weapon is perfect for it. And he's going to share more about why. Тут дистанційне управління на значній відстані стоїть сама тренога з ракетою. Сам пульт управління знаходиться на відстані. Не надо цій же людині, яка знаходиться біля установки, лежать, наблюдати за противником. Okay, I just want to point out, again, a testament to just good military equipment actually isn't overly complicated. And the U.S. is kind of guilty of this lately, where they have a, a single machine that does a million things, and it does them all poorly, like a Swiss Army knife, right? You ever try to use the corkscrew on a Swiss Army knife to actually open a cork? It's like nightmarishly difficult. Same with the blade, unless you're doing something Anything more complex than whittling a stick uh, is going to be so difficult. But the U.S. Army loves Swiss Army knife technologies that does a lot of things poorly. Uh, instead, this is incredibly simple. As you can see here, there looks like a launch key, <coughs> some a couple of on-off switches, uh, and three 
other buttons probably to do things like change the camera mode or something else. It's meant to be idiot proof that you can, uh, and a joystick of course to control the actual flight and camera. It's meant to be easily used, picked up and used by even the most uh, hastily conscripted troop. Вимеряємо, вичисляємо дальності, щоб дальність не перевищувала польоту ракети, і проводимо пуск. Коли збирається їх багато, особливо коли там міномет, кулемет, кулеметний розрахунок, то можна стріляти. Ми бачили рух якийсь незрозумілий. Весь час ми на нього дивилися, суєта, суєта, і виявили, що там встановлюється кулеметний розрахунок. Ми терпили. Yep, this is something that we did commonly in Afghanistan. We would spend a long time observing uh, individuals that we suspected might be enemy troops. And so we would do a lot of time waiting for them to get in position, waiting for them to make themselves uh, vulnerable. And only when we were, one, certain that they had uh, hostile intent or, of course, engaged in hostile action, uh, and that they were at their most vulnerable would we uh, strike at them. Uh, sometimes we even would simply, uh, if we weren't sure that they were truly hostile, we would send them friendly reminders uh, in the form sometimes of flares from mortars. So for example, we would deploy a flare from a mortar and have it go off as a, a harmless flare right over their heads. And it let them know, hi, we're watching you and if you're a goat herder, fine, you have nothing to worry about. But if you're not, you might have a little something to worry about if you try anything. But the ability to just observe the enemy as they make a mistake, as they put themselves in a vulnerable situation, is a tremendous tactical advantage. I love the making decisions collectively with like, lower, lower. No, 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 it's all right, it's all right. Get, get lower. And so that's the thing, it, you know, perhaps they've inflicted some casualties on the enemy and destroyed equipment, both of which are valuable, especially given that it didn't cost you your primary weapon systems or uh, any of all of your troops were never in danger in the first place, right? This is sort of the power of standoff weapons. Um, but even if you didn't, the message that the Russian commander has gotten is that, hey, you push your machine gun out too far and it paid the price. Don't try it again. Next time you're going to have to, well, this is the best, the position you most wanted. You can't have it. You need to find a, an inferior position. And this sort of continuous pressure can really degrade a your enemy's ability to maneuver. Yes. Все, никого нету. Нормально. Ты видел, как туда четко завез? Когда мы замечаем цель, замечаем рух, то, что нас цикавит, мы, вот есть возможность следковать за цель, если она рухома, за помощью жестика. Вот. Можно приближать. Украинское производство сейчас имеет все. Yeah, he talks about how Ukrainian industry can make whatever we need. And it's true. When you have that indigenous arms industry, you literally can make the weapon that you need. And it's one of the things that's an underutilized skill, I think, by the even the U.S. and NATO countries. Um, here's a good example, right? The United States used to have... I want to say five to seven different types of fighter aircraft in its arsenal. They would be used for things like air superiority, deep strike, reconnaissance, um, anti-armor, right? Think about like the A-10, right? Just an anti-armor weapon. Uh, and, and CAS is what we'd really call it. Uh, then you have, of course, right, dogfighting exclusive uh, aircraft, like, you know, the the f-14 for example uh but then the u.s decided no we want 
it'd be more efficient to have like two aircraft and they decided to build this jack of all trades f-35 and it's been a total disaster it's bad it's worse at everything and it honestly now they think would have been cheaper for the united states to build an additional five separate airframes um that were purpose built for just to do one or two tasks exceptionally well uh, but ukraine can make those efficiencies і ракету знову ж, коли ракета запущена, на її треба ще управляти. Це не ті, що системи були радянські, застарілі, які надо було лежати під тим же самим фаготом, біля тієї ж самої установки, вручну вести оце. В карнетах застаріла система, теж вона це надо оператору того ж самого карнета лежати. Yeah, that sounds like uh, extremely dangerous where you have a guided missile but the operator has to sit underneath the launch point. Because remember, if you see the missile, you can pretty quickly figure out where its point of origin was. This is what makes anti-aircraft gunners so dangerous, is that if the aircraft can see at any point where the, where the Stinger missile or the... Um, the Ilga came from, they're going to know where you are. Під ним наводиться і управляють за допомогою повороту вертикального горизонтального наведення. Це установка нова, новітніша, дальність польоту в неї більша, ніж в застарілих зразках України. Дальність до п'яти кілометрів вражання. Five kilometers is a long range that can reach deep behind the front lines. То есть есть типы ракет осколково фугасные для вражения легко бронированные цели и особого складу есть тандемно кумулятивная ракета, яка вражает броню, начиная от. So this is also interesting, of course, that it's reusable. I wonder if the Stugna P uses existing rockets, uh, rockets, uh, guided rockets from, like you said, the Cornet or the. Uh, uh, Fago systems. Uh, I know I probably mispronounced it, but I'm not going to get demonetized. But um, yeah, you, I, if it reuses existing rockets already in Ukraine's arsenal or that it can already manufacture, that's just going to be an additional benefit to these systems that make them even more efficient. Tanka, this is the most difficult and everything else that can be used to be used to be used to Ну що ж, ми зараз підвалі, по нашому сектору активно працює російська артилерія, тож треба перечекати і вже потім буде. And see the Russians again probably have a vague sense of the type of missile that hit and the approximate direction it came from. And so they're probably just dropping rounds onto that location. But of course, as we talked about, there's no Ukrainian uh, soldiers that put themselves at risk to launch that. So that's why they are relatively safe in the headquarters. Будемо пробувати виїжджати з Бахмута. Малими групами в два-три чоловіка переміщаються, заходять в зараз на даний етап, поки ще є. So this is interesting. Of course, as as winter uh, comes to Ukraine, you can see already the leaves are starting to fall. It's getting cooler. We've seen in some parts of the country where there's snow. Uh, so it's going to be. Uh, much more difficult for, as he says, Russian forces to move under cover of foliage. Листочки ліса смухи заходять по ліса смухах, заходять по таких місцях, де менш скритно, по балкам, щоб зайняти панівні висоти навколо. And as, he's just, as we've seen in the tactical map, all the villages surrounding Bakhmut, they are trying to occupy in order to surround and cut off the town. Bakhmuta. Закопуються сразу, закопуються, стають і закопуються, копають нори собі сразу. І е, потім уже між собою з'єднуються і роблять опорні пункти. Зараз листя сипала із дерев, і ми вже маємо змогу їх бачити. На... Yep, as the foliage goes away, uh, two important things start to happen. First off, as he talks about, line of sight gets longer. It's harder concealment. The concealment of wood lines becomes just way worse. But second, the concealment of treetops also gets worse. And when you're in Ukraine, who relies more heavily on drones to detect their artillery, it's probably going to skew towards Ukrainian forces' advantage.
На відстанях невеликих, на підходах, коли вони наближаються. Тобто ми наносимо ураження навіть, коли вони дуже далеко. А застосовуються танки, БМП, їхнє озброєння. Я просто хочу зупинити один інший цікавий систем. Я не можу сказати, чи це частина інтерв'ю, чи він використовує це. Я хочу побачити, чи я можу... Окей, ні, тому що тут є майк. Тобто він вважає... An iPhone. I've seen law enforcement in the U.S. use this, where they actually will mount their phone to a chest rig, and they will have maybe some sort of app that allows them to talk hands-free on like a radio frequency, um, where they can just tap and communicate. It's uh, again, law enforcement. I've s sometimes seem to really swear by it, um, and of course, he's also got his phone functioning as a, a, a chest GoPro, uh, which. Which I think is a pretty efficient use, but again, you've got to have a good battery life. But I think that's still really interesting conceptually as a simple means of communication. Застосовуються танки БМП з їхнє зброєння, як і напряму на водку виїжджають, ну дуже швидко виїхали, відпрацювали, втікають, тож ми вже нашими засобами навчили трошки ховатися від нас, тому вони. Yep, this is what we talk about. You know, if you have technology and you can use it to achieve standoff distance from the enemy, that's a tremendous, tremendous advantage. And it's a morale killer. I can tell you, as someone who was in a war where the enemy used standoff weapons like IEDs, uh, it sucks to rarely, rarely see the enemy or at least know you've seen them. Uh, you know, in my 12 months in combat, I can probably count on one hand the number of times we actually had line of sight um, direct fire uh, contact with enemy forces. Almost 90% of contact, 99% was uh, standoff weapons, IEDs, uh, anti-tank mines they had emplaced. Uh, and you would never know. You're like, is this person who's watching a curious farmer? Is it the person who planted it? Is it a Taliban? You just never know. And it's really frustrating and really demoralizing as a soldier to uh, take casualties uh, against an enemy who is simply, it feels like a ghost. Не так нагліють, як раніше, але дуже сильно застосовують про продавлювання самої піхоти. Велика кількість піхоти постійно рухається. And interestingly enough, they are using their cheapest resource, which is apparently infantry. Нашому напрямку заходять, наноситься ураження, наступні заходять. Ворог питається зараз на даний час зайти перед зимою в місто, щоб зимувати в місті. Ну, на даний час не виходить, так як... And this is what we've talked about. Ukraine, Russian forces really want to seize Bakhmut for like political and propaganda reasons. But the truth is, Bakhmut is not essential to the war effort. It's not operationally significant. And what that means is that events like this, this is the exact war that Ukraine wants, right? They want to take as few casualties as possible while maximizing the casualties of the Russians. They want to make the Russian forces do as much of the work, so to speak, as possible. And that's what he talks about, the infantry attacks, right? Who, you know, who's not getting out of their defensive positions and charging at the enemy is largely the Ukrainian forces, right? They are remaining in very safe, relatively speaking, positions, engaging with longer range tools like the Stugna, like their mortars, machine guns, uh, just anything, artillery, whatever they have to punish the enemy who has to, who ultimately the the Russians are the ones who have to seize territory to achieve their objectives and leave good defensive positions behind. The brigade does not allow him to cross the line of trace. Bakhmut, they ruin it as a pass, not as a... Actually, let's take a look. I, I think I know what highway he's talking about. Um, let me just pull this up real quick and I can show you guys. Okay, here it is. Um, when we zoom in on Bakhmut which is, there we go. Okay, Bakhmut, when they talk about stopping them from crossing the highway, uh, one theory is that he's talking about this highway here, M03, that they're trying to cross it, but they, they kind of have already crossed it up here. I think instead what he's talking about is pro possibly this highway here. Um, this is a uh, railway and also roadway. Um, that runs north-south, uh, obviously to Kurdyumivka, where you can see Russians have taken control. But 
It's a good natural barrier, though holding it is not that important because the Russians obviously can't use it because you can see Ukrainians control the entire right side and Russians control the entire uh, left side. So there's not really any, no, no trains or vehicles are going to be running up and down here, but it's a good natural barrier and it is more important to control the north-south highway um, from starting from the north end of Bakhmut at this cross Nahora, because that does appear to lead to Sevirsk and other locations that Ukrainian forces control, right? It's also intersects with this MO3. And these two major ground avenues of advance are probably pretty important to the Ukrainian forces in terms of keeping their uh, forces resupplied. Also important is, is this rail line and highway as well. Um, but as long as those remain intact and they're not really under threat right now, Ukrainian forces are going to have no problem maintaining their levels of supply and logistics in this fight. Скажем так, уже, ну, скажем, дуже тяжка ситуація для людей, які залишились в місті, буде зимувати так без тепла, без світла, без нічого цього. Приход. Танки використовують вони з закритих вогневих позицій більш, більше, з великої відстані. І БМП. Yeah, he says the tiger, but BMP, I think he's saying BMP, which is not the same thing as a tiger. Um, a tiger, I think, is is the Russian civilian answer, is the Russian answer to an MRAP. Um, and a BMP is an armored personnel carrier. Uh, let's see if we can find a picture of one. Yeah, here's a Russian tiger. Um, and then... Here we'll get a picture of a Russian uh, BMP, right? But you can see the Tiger is a smaller MRAP, uh, and then you know the BMP three, right? An armored personnel carrier. Uh, so just a just a, a small difference in translation, I think. BMP Tiger, we have prostrigali takú techniku. We also use civilian machines. I think technical is like technical, like a civilian vehicle with a. Uh, machine gun or uh, crew-served weapon mounted to it. Даже доїхати в один край просто на якомусь жигулі кинуть його, потім розсосатися, розбігтись по посадкам за ним позицію. Ми займаємо засідку, спостерігаємо, виявляємо їхні вогневі точки, або самі вражаємо, або якщо є така можливість, щоб не не підставляти людей під небезпеку. Right, as they discussed for Ukrainian forces, right, Russians can draw on a deep, deep, deep well of unwilling conscripts, as especially as an authoritarian government. Um, so Ukrainian forces need to preserve their manpower because they don't have a problem with logistics. They have considerable pockets um, and considerable supplies, right, to the tune of billions of dollars in aid. But what they don't have is the depth of people. So they have to expend their material uh, in order to achieve uh, uh, enemy KIA. Пеку то можем ті точки, які ми виявили, передати старшому начальнику на артилерію, і тоді старшими засобами наносимо радження. Вже розширили застосування стугни, тобто ми не тільки по бронетехніці стріляємо, а можемо засікти і артилерію, яку та якщо вона в полі нашого враження, то ми наносимо її досить ефективно. It missed. Okay, that sounded pretty close. Були вагнеровці на початку. Потім зараз на даний час уже декілька This is interesting. Okay, this I didn't realize that I really assumed it was Wagner uh, in charge of Bakhmut, but now it seems like freshly mobilized troops uh, are also involved in the Bakhmut offensive. Чи мобики сюда полізли вже, причому так масово вже їх сюди направляють, то есть, скажем так, одноразово. Если вагнеровці вони воюють, скажем, там за бабки, да, там деньги, там у них don't kid yourself. The Wagner troops are fighting not just for money, though money is probably pretty good. They're also fighting for the fact that they don't want to go back to the Russian penal colonies, which by all accounts are like pretty horrific. Тактика друга все. А це одноразовий, то есть йому дали там задачу, він пошёл, розмінували, на мені подорвався следующий. 
Yep, that is not the person you want to be in this war. Talk about the worst role in the war. It's a freshly mobilized Russian troop. I mean, here's the thing, as we discussed, they have a chance of succeeding. If they can throw enough mobilized troops at Bakhmut, they, they could pull it off. The problem is, is that what will it achieve? They will take tremendous casualties and will achieve very little in terms of operational change. If this is where they're going to send their newly mobilized troops to get, uh, you know, KI aid, then by all means, I think the Ukrainian military is happy to see these uh, the Russians keep it up. Anyway, guys, that is all I had for you. As always, if you want access to the combat video breakdowns that are uh, too spicy for YouTube, too intense, right? The YouTube censors won't let me show you. Become a member of the Patreon. Thanks to my lieutenant tier patrons. You guys make this whole thing possible. I'll see you all in the next one.